So we've cut into uh, to Stephen and Andrea's time by a few minutes, and I'm going to keep my introduction of them quite brief. Just to say that the, we're going back into collaboration for the last session, and the collaborations we talked about earlier are large, were largely focused on, on collection building, and I think now we're going to be looking at a, uh, a somewhat larger and broader view of the whole thing. So, Andrea Gertels and Stephen Abrams, so I'll let you take it from here. Uh, well, thank you, Bob. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, Andrea and I are going to be talking about um, an exploration of uh, new models or models for um, national collaborative work on web archiving. Uh, hopefully this won't be too anticlimactic for you since um, in distinction to every, all the cool stuff we've been hearing all day long, we're sort of talking about something that we haven't actually quite done a whole lot of yet, but, but we're hopeful. Uh, so, first off, um, why are we doing this at all? What's, what's, um, what's the need for uh, this extensive uh, collaboration and cooperation? Um, well, I think um, this is something that, that, that all of you intuitively understand, um, that simply that the, the problems um, inherent to large-scale web archiving are just uh, too fundamental uh, and too significant for any one organization to try to respond to them effectively. Um, there's any number of potential uh, problems that we have to deal with, um, just highlighting two. Um, the two that, that, that tend to come up uh, most often, first of all, there's the question of web scale. Um, certainly if you are a library that is interested in starting up a new program in web archiving, you are going to be faced uh, almost certainly with having to deal with a corpus that is at least one to two orders of magnitude larger uh, than what you've dealt with uh, heretofore. Uh, secondly, um, there's the sense that we are continually falling behind in this uh, ongoing technological arms race. Um, we've uh, heard allusions to this throughout the day, um, uh, that the, uh, the Internet and the web have really undergone this um, amazing sea change over the last however many years uh, from essentially a document retrieval system to this vast distributed uh, virtual machine that's running um, highly dynamic programs. Uh, in this regard, I particularly like the example we saw earlier today of the, um, uh, the scroll bar art uh, because this reminds us that not only is it bad enough uh, that content creators are out exploiting um, a lot of these new um, web capabilities to the fullest extent for their intended purpose, but even beyond that, there are these uh, interestingly creative people who are actively subverting these capabilities for a completely different set of um, uh, probably completely unanticipated and unintended purposes. Uh, so what does this mean a little bit uh, more concretely from um, the experience uh, uh, that we have at the CDL and, and at Harvard? Um, at CDL, we've been interested in working in the area of web archiving since about 2006. Uh, we had an early grant uh, from the uh, LC's uh, NDIP initiative. Uh, we went live with a production web archiving service, or was, in 2008, uh, and since then, uh, this has grown um, quite significantly. We are now supporting uh, over 40 uh, unique curatorial units. Uh, some of these are exuberantly unique. Um, they have uh, about 280 collections, and we're up around 135 terabytes of material. Uh, early on, we made a decision to rely on what's um, becoming a fairly standard uh, open source stack, Heratrix, uh, um, Nutchwax, Open Wayback, uh, and we thought, oh, great, we don't have to do any work. Well, that turned out not to be true. Um, even with uh, the amazing powers of these um, um, open source components, you still need to have a lot of, uh, of uh, infrastructural glue uh, to make these things cooperate. Um, and to uh, implement um, effective workflows. Uh, we also found that we had to develop uh, locally um, a complete curatorial interface that could be used for um, um, uh, defining seeds, um, applying descriptive metadata, crawling sco uh, crawl scopes, and, and so forth. Uh, all of this is running on a fairly large uh, infrastructural footprint. Um, we have um, 11 servers, um, big servers, actually. Uh, there's about 100 terabytes of locally attached uh, staging space, uh, over 150 terabytes of, um, of SAN that's used for both archival and access purposes. Um, from the beginning, WAS has always operated on a, a fee-for-service basis. Um, for within the UC community, um, we're out charging our customers only for the amount of space uh, that they're consuming. Um, 
for external customers, there's an additional service fee. Um, so with this revenue that was coming in, we were able to somewhat dedicate um, about two and a half FTE um, to this project and, and to this product. Um, uh, unfortunately, what we found over these last uh, seven or eight years uh, is two and a half FTE is uh, just about uh, necessary, uh, just about sufficient for dealing with just our necessary operational demands. Um, there has been very little time and resources left over for all sorts of uh, other necessary um, maintenance and improvements. Um, so, for example, we are um, we've fallen very far behind in terms of software upgrades. We're we're still running Heratrix one. Uh, rather than Heratrix 3. Uh, we've never had the time to uh, complete a replacement of Nutch with Solar. Um, we've never had time to implement deduplication. So um, quite a bit of uh, technical debt that has, that has built up there. Uh, so in sort of trying to summarize this whole experience, uh, I would say with a little bit of hyperbole, um, but that even though we're running on a fee-for-service basis, um, the only way we were going to be able to make this a truly sustainable service is we either had to get a whole lot larger or we had to get a whole lot smaller. Um, getting larger just did not seem to be a um, very uh, tractable situation and getting smaller just was not uh, particularly uh, attractive. So um, we felt it is uh, very much necessary for us to find a different way of operating uh, and that almost uh, surely involves um, uh, getting involved with a number of partners that we can help to share out the load. So let me step aside and uh, hear about Harvard. We've had a kind of a similar situation at Harvard with web archiving. We um, started talking to our curators, I think around 2006, asking them, because um, we had, you know, we had been doing digitized collections for a long time, and we wanted to find out what, what matters to you in the born digital realm. What do, what do you want to start collecting and preserving first? And the answer was web archives or, or websites. And so we, we started working on um, and putting together a service for web archiving um, and we're able to put it into production in 2009. The, the original partners that we worked with, um, three curatorial units at Harvard, um, Sussinger Library, the Harvard University Archives, and um, the Reischauer Center were our original um, pilot partners that helped us develop the functional requirements and collect it and test it. Um, like, like was from CDL, it used um, what we thought you know, were, were the obvious um, tools to use, Heratrix way back, Nutchwax, and something that's not supported anymore um, called the um, HCC, which is it's kind of a controller for crawlers, which actually still runs really well for us, but nobody's, nobody's maintaining it. And a variety of, of different open source tools um, some custom Java models, which are basically the glue to make it all work, and a custom curatorial interface. Um, we were happy at the time, you know, in 2009. Um, it, was, it was basically a self-service um, model where the curators could go into the interface and they could come up with, you know, how often this thing should be crawled, which of our standard um, uh, scoping, scopes should this follow, et cetera, and, and it would just kind of work. The whole system would work. And there, was a way, there is a way to automatically push it to our preservation repository, which we were, were happy about. Um, so we, you know, we were ready to celebrate, and then all of a sudden the, kind of the rug got pulled out from under us because all of a sudden, okay, the library is reorganizing in 2009. So it was a, a really bad timing for us because we were just about to say, okay, what should be the operating cost model should this, you know, for this thing? What should be the dedicated staff for this thing? Um, how should we expand this to more curatorial units? Um, so, um, long story short, um, during that reorganization, which actually I, I count as four different reorganizations within that time period, because it, it really was, um, um, our system stagnated. And um, like CDL saw, we, had, we now have years of technical debt. We, we had nobody dedicated um, to this, um, n you know, not from the um, service provider perspective or from the developer perspective. And, um, none of that software has been upgraded during this time, and so Heratrix is now um, several versions ahead. Um, um, we're also still using um, Nutchwax instead of Solar, and we're still using ARC um, instead of Work, and it's still only being used by the original three curatorial units. So um, we looked at this, and we thought, 
Okay, if, if we were to bring, bring this up, up to speed, you know, modernize it, um, scale it up, um, really put it into, you know, production, it, we, we think it would take 2.5 FTE for one year to upgrade it, and that includes some development staff, but also some support staff, some um, liaison to the curators, um, and then three FTE on an ongoing basis. And around two FTE is closer to what the library wants to, to put onto this um, at, at the moment. But um, looking at this and, you know, whether you say two FTE, three FTE, it's kind of really the same. It's not that much of a difference. But the, the, real, the real issue is um, what are you going to spend your development resources on? So you have a certain amount of development resources. Are you, are you going to spend it um, working on, on um, maintaining crawlers, you know, working on to always expanding your full text index, that kind of, just kind of stuff that should already be there? Or are you going to spend it on kind of the more interesting things like the um, supporting new, new research? Um, supporting new ways of acquiring content, um, supporting you know m more modern interfaces, which wouldn't be silos of just web harvests, you know, browsing through that, but it would integrate different types of content and from different institutions, you know, that kind of more interesting work. So, so that's really the issue for us: it, is um, how can we transition to something that is um, in collaboration with a lot of other people and and makes it so that we can spend our developer resources on those things that we can't find elsewhere. Uh, so I think there's also been a number of allusions to um, the potential benefits of collaboration uh, throughout the day. Uh, and these three particular points we saw actually up on the screen this morning. Um, these are um, three areas in which the uh, IIPC has identified um, partly as a justification for its own existence, um, but I think it's pretty clear that uh, basically everything that they're saying here um, in an in international context would apply uh, equally well uh, within the U.S. Uh, in, or, or some other national context. Um, we just feel, certainly based on, on our collective experience as, as well as uh, uh, some others of you that we're partnering with and we've had, we've had conversations with, uh, that collaboration is just the best and the fastest way to build up the largest um, uh, body of internet content. Uh, it's the fastest uh, and the best way to uh, develop, maintain, and enhance um, the, the tool set that's necessary to build up that collection. Uh, and it's the, uh, the best way to um, encourage and engage uh, in outreach um, uh, regarding um, issues surrounding web archiving. So the uh, discussions um, around how to, uh, how to sort of make this happen have been going on now for a number of years. Uh, one of the uh, earliest activities uh, was this uh, cool hosted event um, that unfortunately I did not attend, so I'm gonna let uh, Andrea uh, summarize. Well, many of you us. here I think did attend this and um, I think what stood out for me um, attending this meeting um, roughly three years ago was that it was the first time that, that I had seen a group of US-based um, institutions who are involved in web archiving or are interested in becoming involved in web archiving get together. And it wasn't based, we weren't um, all IIPC members, we weren't all archivet users, we weren't, um, didn't have any sort of organizational affiliation any, any other way other than we were all trying to put together web archiving programs and figure it out. And um, the, the topics, we're very similar today. I mean, it was about tools. It was also about co collaboration. Um, but it, I think it was um, kind of an, imp an important meeting. And, and it started the conversations of, of how can we, in the US, um, leverage our, you know, we're all, we're all trying to do this kind of thing. How can we work together? Uh, so then. Um uh, well, this is back about a year ago now, uh, as we became uh, more and more convinced that we needed to find collaborative partners, um, we started having some one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations um, with uh, peer institutions, certainly Harvard, uh, Stanford, um, our colleagues at uh, UCLA and other places. Uh, and uh, it, it, uh, we, we quickly thought that it would be useful to uh, actually uh, convene um, a face-to-face -face summit um, which happened in June of last year. Um, these are the, the people who were able to um, attend. 
Uh, and it was very, um, it was very useful and, and, and good meeting. Um, the the uh, fairly um, complete notes are available on, on that Google Doc. Um, but I think most importantly, um, as is uh, mentioned here in this one little quote, that there was um, complete agreement that, uh, as we say here, more robust collaboration was desirable in order to collectively uh, address the challenges that all of these individual institutions were facing. Uh, so. Um, of course, while there's always great enthusiasm for things in the abstract, um, there's the more difficult question of, of you know, what can we do um, sort of uh, concretely um, to achieve these highly desirable goals. Uh, so one of the follow-up um, activities from that meeting was the development of this document um, uh, available here, what we're calling Community Principles for Web Archiving at Scale. Um, and uh, it's a fairly short document. Um, it started to just um, sketch out the, the, the overall structure of uh, or what we're calling a lightweight structure um, by which web archiving institutions can work together collaboratively. Um, one of the key um, steps that was identified in this document um, uh, is the, first of all, based on the recognition um, that there are at least uh, three important operating modes for web archiving activities that we want to um, both facilitate uh, and nurture. Um, there are certain things that uh, may want to happen most efficiently uh, on a centralized manner. Uh, there are things that want to be distributed but coordinated, and then there are probably want to be things that are always going to be um, highly customized uh, for local um, uh, needs and purposes. Um, so from a technical point of view, we think what's, um, what's really necessary here is to define a comprehensive set of APIs that can expose uh, the full range of web archiving function um, sort of at these critical junctures in nominal workflows. Um, this is important, we think, for um, uh, making the possibility of, of, of adhering to, um, to this uh, very high-level principle of trying to rely on community solutions whenever they're available uh, and only fall back to customized solutions uh, whenever necessary, um, and particularly whenever you think that you can uniquely add value. So um, with that in mind, we would get um, sort of an infrastructural picture that looks something like this. Um, you probably can't see that at all. Uh, basically, the, um, uh, the, purple, the purple boxes represent um, uh, high-level um, activities in, uh, in sort of a, a, in a nominal workflow. Um, so if we work, uh, I'm not a technology guy. Um, if you work your way down from, from the top to the bottom, um, we're sort of starting out with um, you know, curatorial, inter, uh, curatorial management um, where you would be defining seeds, um, defining cross scope, um, adding a curatorial description. Uh, then moving down through um, capture, both in terms of traditional uh, uh, web crawling as well as our alternative capture mechanisms, um, storage, uh, indexing for, uh, for future discovery, uh, search, replay, and then down towards the bottom, um, a, a new set of evolving computational tools, um, some of which we, we just saw a little bit earlier this afternoon. Um, the, now, any or all of those activities, um, you could decide to outsource to some sort of a, a service provider, such as Archivit. Uh, that's what we're representing on that uh, left-hand side, what we're calling a, you know, sort of a common core. Um, or any or all of those, um, you may want to um, hold on to more tightly um, and, and run those as local activities. We're sort of showing that on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, and then because what we're very much interested in is to allow the free definition of hybrid workflows, where you have an appetizer from column one and, and the entrees from column two, um, we are interposing those green boxes which represent um, a whole series of APIs um, uh, at the interface between those, those large um, workflow items. Um, and these a APIs can be exploited both for injecting information into or extracting information out of any particular instantiation of, of a web archiving infrastructure that would, would implement those APIs. So um, there's been some um, follow-up work um, that is trying to take that picture and turn that into an actuality. And again, I'll let Andrea talk through some of this. Okay, so, so this looked to us like the start of a national digital platform, which IMLS is very much interested in. And so 
um, we decided to put a grant in, um, the National Leadership Grant for Libraries, and the way they do it now um, for those particular grants is first you put in a preliminar preliminary proposal and then you can be invited to put in a full proposal. Um, so we decided to, to go for the, um, the one earlier this year and invited a number of institutions to Boston in January <laughs> to help us put together a grant and for some reason a lot of them said okay and came to Boston and um, but, but that was before all the snow in February so it was okay and helped us put together this preliminary proposal which we submitted and there were three strands of activities in this proposal the first was an environment environmental scan um, what are our common challenges what are our use cases what are the functional requirements um, and then there were two types of collaboration, developing these collaborations. One was from an organizational standpoint, and the other was from a technical standpoint. So from the technical standpoint, um, you know, can, does that um, model make sense with the APIs? Can, can we prototype some of them? Can we test some of them? Um, and can we show that they really are plug and play and they can work with different components? Um, from the organizational standpoint, um, if you're gonna put your, you know, your web archiving program into this kind of collaboration, you want to make sure that this collaboration is going to last, it's sustainable, it has funds, it has commitment, um, that it's, it's kind of a collaboration that can support activities from smaller institutions as well as larger institutions, that everybody has a way to participate and to, to put something into that collaboration. Um, so there were those three strands, strands of activity. We were not invited to submit the full proposal, which was unfortunate, but um, we have talks since then and are, um, want to submit it again in another um, probably IMLS grant round. In the meantime, we have um, a couple different sets of activities going on to prepare better, you know, based on the re uh, what we got back from the reviewers um, from that grant. And one is um, um, doing some work with the IIPC um, because they have some of the same, obviously, in interests and challenges as we do. And um, you can learn about some of this by, um, there was a recent DLib magazine article that you can look at, and it was written by um, some of us in the preservation working group within the IIPC. And um, in, the, in this article, it talks about um, what is the current state of, of digital preservation for web archiving for IIPC members. And it's something that does not get a lot of attention normally. I mean, even today, if you think about the different topics we, we heard, it's, a lot of it is still about collecting. You know, you know it, it, it's good that a lot of it now is about use of web archives, but we're still not quite having a lot of conversations about the preservation of web archives. Um, and so we did run a survey for the IIPC members, and you can um, learn some of the results if you read that article. Uh, it's not... Um, it's not looking very great, <laughs> I'll tell you that. Um, um, I'll give you one example which just really st stands in my mind, is, is kind of disturbing a little bit. And um, so we asked about different preservation practices and um, you know, do you do this for your web archives, do you do this? And we asked about repl replication, which is a really basic thing. You, everybody knows you need to have more than one copy, right, of something if, if you want to hope to keep this thing. And roughly 50%, a little under 50%, were not even doing replication for their web archives. Um, and you know, it, it's understandable because a lot of these institutions are collecting a lot of material, you know, at, at the domain level. But still, you know, if you're going to continue to put um, a lot of effort and funding into this, you you want to make sure that you can hold on to this. So there's clearly a lot of work that needs to go on in the pre preservation arena. Um, the article goes on to talk about, uh, over the years, what we've done in the Preservation Working Group to, to address our challenges. And it's always been around um, sharing tools and practices and that kind of thing. So there is a lot of precedent to um, having this kind of, you know, this kind of technical solutions being uh, one part of the um, solution for helping us with our challenges. Um, recently at the um, IIPC General Assembly at Stanford, there were several presentations um, that talked about the need for APIs, this, this very same thing that we had been working on, because everybody um, is concerned about maintaining these infrastructures over time and being able to meet new researcher expectations. Uh, and so, you know, wanting to have these maintainable infrastructures where you can say, okay, this QA tool is now better, I'm going to try to switch over to that, or um, this researcher tool looks great, I'm just going to plug it into my system. But you can't do that kind of thing unless you do have this common 
API infrastructure kind of thing. Um, so since there was a lot of interest at the, within the IIPC, we put out a survey um, to see if there would be interest in pursuing, um, doing some work in this area. And um, it's, the survey is still open, but we've heard from 18 different institutions so far, and 100% of them are interested in this idea of, of APIs. And it's now, um, yeah, I think it is still 94% are willing to, to participate in a new um, IIPC working group to work on this area to develop the use cases, the functional requirements, um, even the um, prototype, the technical specifications for an API. Um, so um, how does that relate to what we were talking about from the national pr perspective? Um, well, maybe we ought to talk about the international context. I, I, don't, I don't know, but at the very least, what we can do is um, take the use cases, the functional requirements, the technical specifications that we get from this um, IAPC working group and combine them with parallel efforts that we'll have to do here in the U.S. Um, because we know, you know, not all, all of us involved in web archiving are in the IIPC. And we do have some special um, requirements that do need to, go, to, to be fed into this um, national digital platform. Um, so um, wrapping up, um, I, th I hope what we've been able to show you is that there, and uh, this is obvious to you all because I, you know this too, there's widespread recognition of the benefits of collaborative approaches. Um, we heard earlier, what was the phrase, radical collaboration. and. It, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of us in favor of that. Um, a lot of interest in APIs and willingness to work together on this, which is great. And um, that we are continuing to look for funding opportunities to facilitate this effort. Um, and so if you have ideas for how to advance this, we'd be very interested in that as well. Thank you. Thanks. Um, in your uh, architectural diagram there, I couldn't help but noticing display API. And I kind of was wondering what kind of requirements uh, do you have there that go beyond what the Memento protocol gives, which is better than an API. It's a, an RFC. Mm -hmm. And it's already supported by Open Way Back and a lot of other systems. Yeah. Uh, we don't really have any tangible requirements at this point. We have a diagram. <laughs> but, um, so, so part of the environmental scan, w one part of it, we'll be seeing what are the existing APIs, what are the existing things we can use, because obviously we don't want to create something where there's already something we can use. Uh, yes. Front here. Um, yeah, so my background from coming from a very small arts nonprofit and um, having to think about participating in collaborative web archiving efforts and seeing this diagram is, of course, kind of intimidating. And um, uh, what, what we managed to do is also because uh, we, we, I think we made some quite good progress with, with web archiving for ourselves and have been doing since 1996, but we haven't, for example, approached things at, at web scale. And I, I wonder this is such a thing that seems totally undisputed here, that everything has to be at an astronomic scale. And I wonder if you want to get more uh, input into, into this field, you, you th should think about small institutions that don't even have the, I don't know, that, that will never be able to, to put even half of this uh, work uh, into work what you have on this diagram but um, it is more like the experimentation and the uh, and also I interesting input just I think is very much located at small institutions but uh, yeah if you need to be I don't know a paying member of several uh, organizations also even to participate I'm so happy to be invited here by the way yeah? <laughs> that's, that's great um, and you know how to do that but uh, yeah, I think this is, this is a big thing because small institutions, they can give the depth instead of the breadth. And for example, using the Memento protocol, it can still be a universal kind of web archiving effort without, um, yeah, 
how many APIs I would need to implement here to even take part in this party. I, I think yep. that's, that's, yeah, just, just how I see the world. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a very fair point. Um, the, the, most of the uh, issues and the results that we've been talking about here reflect um, you know, the needs of the organizations that are participating in this activities um, and which we do tend to be more on the larger side. Um, I mean, here at the CDL, we're, we're supporting, you know, 10 campuses, uh, you know, lots of curators, you know, a lot of collections and so forth. Um, the picture itself, yeah, could be seen as being intimidating, but again, the, the point here is, is not that any, any one organization would be responsible for implementing everything on there. It's th what we're trying to uh, get across here is that you could pick and choose. You know, I want to, yeah. Okay, uh, I, I want to answer that question by uh, channeling Jimmy, I don't know if he's still here. Uh, the, the point about, um, so what, we, what we're facing is a situation where most of the tools that we use currently come from a uh, system architecture background that's now obsolete. And what Jimmy was showing is that by using the, t the system architectures that have been developed for web scale uh, systems outside preservation, we can build systems that actually scale down to a, a Raspberry Pi. And the piece that, that Jimmy didn't mention um, is something that we talked about at the IAPC GA, which is also that there are now extremely good tools for delivering pre-configured assemblies of complex web scale systems such as um, Docker and so on that can be used by people who are putting them together to deliver these things to people in a, a plug and play fashion. I think what we're really facing is, is actually not so much the need to define complex new architectures, but simply to um, rebuild our infrastructure using current web scale uh, programming and system technologies. Um, first of all, I, I agree with Dragon. Um, I second that. <laughs> but to, to go back to the point about APIs, and we see 100% of people you know, agree we should be doing this, I think with funders, a big part of the problem is they expect us to have everything figured out going into the, the grant, you know, and it doesn't happen that way. We know that, you know, needs arise. You see how the potential of something. There are people out here, e here today that could help us do those things. There needs to be more nimble funding. There needs to be some repositories of money where you can make a quick pitch or a quick explanation why you need this, why you want to try it. A little bit of um, you know, support from the community to say yes and, um, and repositories of people to do it. So I think you know, we have to kind of press for new, new models of, of funding. Um, but I think also what we're, what we're trying to do with, with this, albeit complicated picture, is to facilitate um, that more nimble experimentation uh, that, that, you were, uh, that you were talking about. Because if, if you could freely uh, inter intermix all these different components, you, you can tinker around, uh, around the edges. You don't, have to, you don't have to be touching the entire uh, full monolithic system. Um, so, I mean, that's certainly something that we at the, at the CDL are, are very much interested uh, in this kind of approach for, for exactly that reason. Um, we're actually shifting from running our own infrastructure um, over to the use of Archivit um, to address many of the concerns that, that we talked about, uh, you know, at the beginning of, of, of the presentation. And we're doing that precisely because we think that will allow us to reallocate our limited uh, local resources to, uh, to highly added value um, systems, um, you know, uh, alternative um, enhanced, enhanced discovery, alternative capture, and, and uh, exactly those types of things, where we'll then be able to plug in the results of that work um, into, you know, a commodity solution. Yes. In, in addressing the organizational side, so the, that third part of the, of the grant, um, 
two weeks ago, Catherine Skinner gave a great keynote out at Archiving that was speaking specifically about, you know, when we think about collaborations, often it is sort of, you know, as, assumed to be large players and small players really aren't at that table and part the whole point she was making was what we need to figure out is what do people have to offer and then bring those people in whether they're from a large organization that has no money from a small organization that has a lot of funding and a lot of technical expertise or somewhere that can actually provide other sort of organizational or content depth to it and so speaking um, to the point that was raised earlier of, you know, if you're a small organization, how can you, how can you participate? I think exactly looking at what are our collaborative not, um, models that we're building and making sure that people can in fact participate so we have that diversity of the voices at the table. Yes. So um, smaller institutions uh, have a real challenge in this domain, I think that's pretty clear. Isn't it the case that the API models that you're putting up there would allow um, smaller software packages that allowed sort of downloading and, and preserving websites to be plugged in to other systems that could then preserve them and provide access to them? So it could enable a more diverse approach to web archiving uh, at the lower level as well. Yes, that's, that's the supposition that we're moving ahead on, yes. But yeah, I, I agree, uh, I, but I, I think Stephen brought up something that's worrying me and uh, that uh, Abby Smith Rumsey um, stressed in her talk at the IPCGA, which is, so you're saying you want to concentrate on high value added uh, activities for your community. Those high added value activities are almost all concerned with access and not with actually collecting the stuff. What it looks like to me is that what everybody wants is for the Internet Archive to collect everything and people will grab pieces of it and build di customized delivery systems on top of it. And the difficulty with that is what Abby was pointing out is that this is building a monoculture situation and this is defining what is archivable as what the Internet Archive can get their hands on. And that's a very dangerous path to be going down. Um, <coughs> and that what we really need here is precisely the ability to plug into the entire infrastructure, not into our private infrastructures, multiple different collection technologies. And part of what is needed in re-engineering our, our uh, collection tools is the kind of approach that INA developed where um, they, they, because of the diversity of the um, audiovisual sites that they were collecting, they had to develop an architecture with many different customized collection tools coexisting behind in, in one piece of, of an infrastructure. And that involves defining things like the um, collection proxy that actually collects stuff and the management tools that target the, the uh, collectors and allow them to decide, for example, that, oh, I found something on this site that needs this other collector to go collect it. Um, um, it's that kind of plug and play infrastructure for collection is very important in avoiding the idea that the only stuff we can preserve is stuff that Heratrix can get its hands on. Um, well, we're, 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 we're certainly interested in, in um, added value discovery, uh, but we're also very much interested in added value um, capture. Um, we're very happy to, to let our archive it be responsible for um, you know, the routine capture, the Heratrix-based capture, um, but um, we, we know that that is missing a lot of stuff that our curators are interested in. Um, so having the ability to have alternative capture mechanisms that could then uh, be injected into our, our common archivic collections is something that um, seems to be um, a very important aspect for us. Right. Um, so this, I think the slides will be available so you'll be able to see the picture better because it's really hard to see, I know. Um, so near the top it has a, a module that's for alternative capture because um, you know, I, in our case, we have content that can't, we have um, web archive content or websites that have been given to us that we can't integrate with the rest because they're in a completely different format. 
Um, and you, you, you probably have cases um, it, with that same way. People don't give you arcs or works, right? I mean, that's not what they have. They have other, you know, content in other formats. So we definitely need um, a variety of different ways to collect this content. Um, but the, the thing about this, this um, model is it uses, on the left and the right, it's actually using the same exact APIs. So it's saying that we, what we should work towards is having our tools speak the same interfaces so that we can plug and play, so that we can have the opportunity to do alternative captures, et cetera. And so a lot of times when we, when we talk about this, we do focus on the access side because that is the side that um, you know, does lead to new research and, and has the biggest bang for your buck. But there's um, definitely interest, um, I know within my institution, in um, the, the preservation side as well, in the alternative capture as well. S um, slightly different topic uh, of great concern, and that is, you know, one of the chief barriers to use of web archives is the creation of disparate, different web archives in different places, and to tell our researchers, oh, go to these seven places and maybe you'll find some useful content and try to merge them and try to do something with them. I think it's a big challenge, but we have to address this question of discovery and, and the user experience that we're trying to create for historians and other users of this content. And the Internet Archive has a great value in that respect for being a consolidating place that people can do single searches. Um, but I'm interested in whether the modeling that you've talked about would help to address the broader discovery question as well. Uh, I, I, it, it certainly could. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a box for that. Um, uh, and I know uh, that, well, uh, I don't want to speak for Jefferson, but the Internet Archive is, is certainly is interested uh, in this. They they've participated very fully in, in this effort. Um, as a matter of fact, um, you know, there's actually a subset of the institutions that were involved on in that failed IMS proposal that have just put in a new proposal, um, more tightly scoped, um, addressing some of the concerns that, that, that came back with the reviewers' notes on, on the original one. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, Archivit is going to be moving ahead with the development of, you know, not, not this comprehensive set of APIs, but they're going to, is a test case, they'll be moving forward with, um, I think, an export uh, API um, with the idea that, you know, if that proves to be beneficial, that they could then move on um, to exposing other aspects of the archivist function. I don't want to discussion, thank you for the statement. Okay, thank you. And the, the point of that is, uh, you know, if you look at your program, you'll notice it says closing discussions are, were supposed to have started a little while ago, and the reception is not supposed to start yet. Um, you're all sitting there thinking, my God, we've been here all day. When are they going to let us go and drink? And uh, there were two reasons why we scheduled the closing discussions as we did. Uh, one is that we planned to end before the food arrived. Uh, I'm happy to say that probably is no longer true. Uh, but the other one is that, uh, you know, we, the, last, the last maybe 15 minutes have kind of morphed from what we expect, exactly as we expected, into discussion as opposed to just a bunch of questions. Uh, that's trivializing questions. But anyway, uh, what we did want, I, you know, throughout the day, you've been hearing some occasionally references to tomorrow. And I just wanted to provide a little bit of explanation there. When we first started to plan this meeting, we thought, well, we're asking all of these, uh, you know, these speakers and these researchers who have done all this work and, and involved in these collaborations to come here, uh, as long as they're going to be here and travel all this distance, let's carve out some time on, on the next day for them to have uh, just some focused discussions around some of these issues. And then as that started to develop, we started to think, see the value of more people getting added and so forth. The problem is we, we have a limited amount of space tomorrow, so we had to cut off that and not everyone will have an opportunity to take part in those discussions. Uh, I, I really regret that because there's been a, so much good discussion here. But that also means we definitely wanted to provide uh, an opportunity now for, uh, for some of that discussion to take place, for anyone here to be able to say, you know, give some reactions to things they've heard, uh, ask some further questions of, of the audience or, or anyone in particular. Uh, I won't make you stay here longer than you want to, but I still want to make that opportunity be available. What I will say so that I don't have to repeat it again so that you're aware of it, 
The reception that will take place is on the sixth floor of this building. Just take the elevator down to six, and it's on the opposite side. Um, there's a cafe and a terrace and wine and food and so forth. So, mic is open. Are there uh, people who want to say something or ask something? Over here. of the scope of this uh, discussion. Um, Andrea alluded to it. In our organization, we need to capture websites that are not necessarily going to be readily available to the public. They're internal websites. They're um, usually for legal or eventually for archival purposes. I work at a university archives. And I was wondering if anybody has any comments on that. Um, we run into issues with things like pin protection or um, just not being able to uh, provide access the way people imagine you would in, in a traditional library setting. I'm sure there are people here who could speak to that. I know we all have, well, I won't say all, many of us have similar situations. I think uh, you know, most of us have a, a mixture of what can be made public and what cannot, and various ways of trying to control that. Uh, Abby? we get a mic to Abby? Hi, uh, excuse me. Uh, I have a brief announcement. Uh, my co-PI, uh, Dr. Edward Fox, uh, had secured a special issue on web archiving on International Journal of Digital Libraries. And we will put out a couple of papers very soon. Uh, please stay tuned, and you're all welcome to participate. Thanks a lot. I can cover the on-site, off-site access <laughs> issue. Um, at the Library of Congress, we, even though the Copyright Office is in our building, that makes it worse for us because <laughs> we have to follow very strict rules, um, unfortunately. So we have a lot of content that we haven't received off-site access permissions for, and that is restricted to on-site only. We can provide the metadata, but not the capture, so we are struggling with this and we don't think there are a whole lot of users coming into the reading rooms and using those. <laughs> We're pretty sure there aren't. I just started to get some web metrics about that because there are some terminals that are tracking that. So it'll be interesting to see if anybody finds our web archives <laughs> that way. Um, we've done other things like ship data. I don't know if uh, Matt's still here, but we have shipped data to researchers outside of the library, which is an interesting use case. And we can do that again, but it's a lot of work. Um, but it's a struggle to try to figure out how people might use archives on site or even know that we have them. So like the BNF, you have to go to the library in Paris to access the archives there. And they have little terminals that say access the web archive here. But how many people actually do that? Who knows? And Archivit has restricted access functionality. In it, so. There's lots of people that collect via Archivit that do not make it public and can either provide local access via WARCs or restricted IP range. Yeah. It's not just about restricted access, it's about capture. Uh, I think Brian had the mic first. Yeah, so I wanted to. Uh, touch on something that I, I don't think I've heard anyone talk about, sort of the opposite of archiving uh, that may fall under the right to be forgotten. Um, there's something timely in the news. Just, I think yesterday, Twitter decided to shut down uh, the Sunlight Foundation's polytoops or something. I don't know how they say it. But they archive the, tw the tweets of politicians even when they say something embarrassing and later delete it. Um, and they, Twitter, took the position, right, that uh, yeah, you know, even politicians ought to be allowed to make mistakes and, and delete something, and, and we're going to cut off your API access um, because of what you're doing. Um, we have a problem like this that we experience every day. I get angry emails from litigants who are like, why are you violating my privacy by putting my court case online? And I, <laughs> I have to say, <laughs> We've, we've come up with methods for dealing with that, um, mainly what we, t and I've given whole talks about it, but the short version is 
if you get people out of Google, they're satisfied, right? They don't, <laughs> they don't really care if, I, if their stuff stays on my site so long as Googling their name doesn't bring up their document. But anyway, if, if people are interested in these kinds of issues, we have spent a lot of time thinking about them and would enjoy talking about it over drinks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I'll address the collection of, of restricted sites problem because this is something we do all the time because we collect subscription academic journals. And so we have to deal with login pages. We have to deal with, uh, in some cases, we have a specific uh, uh, user agent that the, the site recognizes as being, yeah, it's okay, you don't need to ask these guys to log in. We can do it with, uh, over HTTPS with a certificate check at both ends. Um, there, are, there are a number of techniques for doing this. I mean, if, if you control the crawler and the website, the easiest way is to tell the website what the, what the IP address of the crawler is. <laughs> and uh, that, that will fix the problem in, in a very simple way. Um, but yes, it's a, it's a pain. Um, if, if, you really, if you really need to do this in, in with only marginally cooperative websites, um, we have some advice. Quick scan. Okay, I'm going to end just by thanking again the people who put this together, uh, particularly Alex Thurman, Anna Parici, and uh, our, our wonderful Mike Handlers here who have been with us the whole day taking care of these things. And thank all of you for coming and the Mellon Foundation for making all of this possible. Thank you very much. <laughs>